Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Carol Looper. I'm a member of CMC's Board of Trustees, and I'm a retired reporter. Although in this room are a lot of the people that I used to compete with and read the paper every day to get the news, and now I just read the paper every day to get the news and don't compete anymore. So welcome, everyone. Today is the annual Carol A. McGuire Legacy Forum, celebrating arts and culture. The State of News, also sponsored by the Columbus Foundation and Dispatch Media Group. Each of our sponsors and partners are represented here by many friends and associates. Please help me thank them. Please help me welcome Natalie Parsher, Vice President for Communications and Marketing at the Columbus Foundation, to introduce our forum. Natalie. Thank you, Carol. The Columbus Foundation is proud to support the Columbus Metropolitan Club and its mission to engage community conversations on important topics. We appreciate what you bring to Columbus each week as we do your partnership when the foundation undertakes special community events such as the Big Table. In my role at the foundation, I directly interact with the full range of media. However, no matter how much is changing and how we communicate information and news today, we are especially grateful for the standards, the thoroughness, and the commitment that our local newspapers provide us every day across the full spectrum of our community. We know print journalism faces strong headwinds. Fewer customers mean declining revenues, and the new media and social media that are replacing traditional news sources are not always bound to the time-honored traditions of journalistic integrity and truth. Today's discussion could not be better timed, nor could we hope for better sources to learn from on this important topic. <clears throat> Pardon, please welcome our speakers. We have Senior News Director for Content at the Cincinnati Inquirer, Michael Perry. Editor of the Columbus Dispatch, Alan D. Miller. President of Advance Ohio and Cleveland.com, Christopher Quinn, and our host, former Ohio State Representative for the 17th District and former editor of the Columbus Dispatch, Mike Curtin. Mike, the stage is yours. Thank you, Natalie, uh, and thank you, gentlemen, for making time for this discussion. Uh, those who manage our legacy media businesses today are among the most overworked people anywhere. We are about to discuss why. Last week, the Associated Press reported, uh, and those of you who read the dispatch online or in print saw it in Sunday's dispatch, reported that in the past 15 years, newspapers disappeared in 1,400 cities and towns across America, 1,400. Our discussion will look at many factors behind this trend, but the primary one, of course, is the ongoing digitization, unrelenting digitization of our society. The Pew Research Center reports that among Americans who prefer to read the news rather than watch it, and that's a minority to begin with, nearly two-thirds prefer to read news online rather than in print. These findings dovetail with ongoing declines in print circulation, decisions by some papers to reduce home delivery, and even to reduce the number of days they print at all, as we've recently seen with the Toledo Blade. Given these trends, how much longer do you see our Ohio Metro dailies, including the ones you supervise, continuing to publish in print form at all? Michael, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Well, <laughs> I could be a rich man if I answered that. Um, you know, the, I think the first thing is to stop thinking about it as a print audience. I mean, our audience, we actually reach more people than we've ever reached before. Now, how that translates into business is a whole different matter, but as far as uh, reaching an audience, I think in January, uh, we used Comscore to measure our unique visitors in the market. We had 4.2 million unique visitors. That's just a digital audience. That's in addition to our print subscribers. So when you, when you think about that, even in our heyday 10 or 15 years ago or 20 years ago, 
um, we weren't reaching four million people uh, in the course of a month. So, so that's a positive. How we turn it into a business model is the magical question we'd all love to be able to answer. Which Chris will probably answer for us now. Chris? <laughs> then I'm going to write it down. <laughs> I, I agree. This really isn't a discussion about uh, what's up with print. I, I think print is going away very, very quickly. I think in that Pew report, it was down to, what, 7% of people are actually uh, looking at it. Um, We've transitioned away from that, and, and, and you're right. We have the biggest audience we've ever had. We, we actually, with more limited resources than we've had you know, in 50 years, are producing more content than we've ever produced. Um, the trick is, how do you make money on that? And, and I'm more optimistic than I think uh, many are in our industry that we're slowly getting there. I mean, the, 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 the long thought was, we'll just convert print advertising to digital advertising. Um, that won't work. Digital advertising plays a role. Uh, having people pay for content plays a role. Having specialty products that you put out that people want to pay for plays a role. And, and we're getting there. I mean, there's been a lot of work done in the industry to figure it out. Every year we get a little bit closer. Yeah, you know, at the same time, we face these wins where our staff is, uh, is dropping, but, but I actually have confidence that, that by creating multiple streams of revenue, we'll be able to continue to do the work that people value that had been in print and, and in, in many more beneficial ways. Um, we, we produce content online that you could never fit in print. One of our most popular uh, features every year is we get restaurant inspections from throughout our region and we publish them all online. It takes up a huge amount of space. People spend hours and hours going through them. They're one of the stickiest pieces of content we have and you could never have fit that into a printed paper and now you can have it all at your fingertips on our site. Same experience in Columbus. I'm, I'm curious, how many people here subscribe to a daily newspaper? God bless you all. <laughs> this is wonderful. Um, I love seeing this. This. Audience, this is the audience, audience I've seen in years. <laughs> so to me, that says that print has a runway that we can't see the end of. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, I, I agree completely with, with what my colleagues have said here, but um, we're in the newsroom, we're agnostic about what platform, as we say in the business, you want to receive your news on, whether it's in print, on your phone, on your computer. Um, we just want you coming to us for your news because we feel that it's still the most um, valuable, verified, vetted, uh, researched, reported news that you can find anywhere. Um, when, when people tell me that, uh, well, I don't, I don't need the newspaper. I can get what I need on um, Facebook or uh, on television. Then, um, then we start a conversation about what kind of depth and 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 accuracy you find in those places. Um, so, um, I. I won't sit here and say that print's going to last forever, but I don't see it going away anytime soon. And at the same time, we're all in this awkward sort of situation where we're competing with people who don't have to own and operate a massive manufacturing business in addition to paying for, you know, what amounts to a, a fraction of the cost for an online portal to deliver news to you electronically. Um, that that's a, a big factor in um, in the finances that we face right now, and it's also why um, those of you who subscribe to print papers uh, have been asked to pay more because um, advertising has declined, and we we hope that those who do value what we do and also want it in print are are willing to pay more for it. And I thank you for doing that. Thank you, gentlemen. Maybe starting with Alan and coming this way, as you've uh, set this up pretty well. Uh, for decades and decades and decades, for pretty much all of the 20th century, the standard business model for newspapers was you get 75 to 80 percent of your revenues from advertising and 20 to 25 percent um, from subscribers. Can you share with, us, share with us what that pie chart looks like today for each of your organizations? 
Well, it's nothing like that now. I mean, I, honestly, I don't know what the the percentages are, but it's um, it's more toward the subscriber than than the advertiser now, and um, and I know that can be. Uh, a difficult decision for some people. Do I want to continue paying that uh, amount for the newspaper? But uh, clearly people do, and we greatly value that you value it. The, um, you know, the whole revenue issue with, with newspapers, talking about it historically is kind of funny. I, I, this is a time of the year where we kind of tweak our goals for the staff, and we do a lot of brainstorms and think about which direction we want to go. And so as we were wrapping up that process, a 39-year-old editor in the newsroom was kind of glum. And I said, I went up to her, I said, what's wrong? She goes, you know, it, we, we don't have any guarantees. We, we don't know what the future is. We didn't have to used to, we didn't used to have to worry about money. <laughs> and what's remarkable about that is we were probably the only industry that didn't have to worry about money because we were rolling in it. What other industry knows what the future is five years out? I mean, who works in a, in a business that is not constantly thinking about how do I sustain this? Where does the revenue come from next month and next year? We're now in a situation where we're being forced to be innovative every day. I mean, it, every day you're looking at how are people ingesting our content, how are habits changing, and it's kind of energizing, and it's a roller coaster ride, but that's a lot more fun than just kind of sitting back on your heels and letting money roll in. I think... <laughs> I, I think I, I disagree with I, that. No, no. I, I think the information people get from us today is much more dynamic. It's much more interesting because of what we see online. We know exactly what people want to see and what what they they trade on. Our company is slowly starting to um, move into charging uh, the highest end users for content. And what they've learned in the markets where they've started this is exactly what content is triggering people to subscribe. And it's breaking news, some of which is crime, it's sports, but the highest turnaround per piece of content is public interest journalism. That, 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 that's, there's not a lot of it because our resources are tapped, but that's the content that turns the most people into subscribers. That's great to see. I mean, that's, that's genuine feedback. People are putting up money for that. So. Again, I'm more confident than these guys are. I also think he's crazy that if he doesn't see a runway for print ending. <laughs> I'm confident. I just like when money was rolling in. <laughs> uh, when people ask what's changed, I, I always talk about uh, the screen behind my head that has in real time how many people are on our site, how many are reading every story, how long they're on that story, how many people have read it all day. And it's almost like an obsession. We're watching it as the numbers change in real time. And, you know, whereas 15 years ago, you get a press release and maybe you knew the PR person, you just did it. Now we, we just, we, we do fewer things and we try to do more things well. And we try not to expend our resources on things that there is no readership for. Uh, 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 Apology to any CFOs in the room, but the hiring of a CFO at a major corporation might get a hundred, you know, page views. We're just not devoting time and resources to that anymore, and that's a big change that we have to educate the community on as well. Um, I'll, I'll quickly try to answer that your question originally. I know, like twenty uh, five years ago, I think 25, 20 percent of our revenue was digital, eighty percent print, and I think. In the last couple of years, we've crossed over, and I think on our on our uh, platforms, 51 point something percent of our revenue is now digital. So that was a big change for us um, uh, in the evolution of of the industry. But it's a smaller amount. So so yes. that that yeah, digital is overtaking uh, print, but the total is smaller, and so none of yes. us have the size staffs we had 10 years ago, probably five a, years ago. Probably a third, yeah. I would say staff, about a third, I think. The, compared to 20 years ago, uh, Pew has reported there are only half as many journalists working in newsrooms um, in our legacy um, operations. Uh, as print continues to decline, and I, I agree that print is fading out probably sooner rather than later, 
uh, what are the economics of trying to keep quality journalism not just alive but healthy? And this, I suppose, gets into how do you, what are you doing now, and how do you get better at stimulating people to actually pay a going rate for their digital subscriptions? So I, I'll just go back to what I just described. We, we don't do the things that don't draw an audience. We know in real time what's drawing an audience, so we try to focus on those kinds of things. And again, breaking news, uh, enterprise, um, good public service journalism, and sports absolutely draws an audience. So I think we, we move our resources in that direction. We try to be smarter. And even though our newsroom is probably a third of what it was 15, 20 years ago, we still have the, lar we still have the largest news gathering organization in our market. Um, so when people talk about why should we be encouraged about the Cincinnati Enquirer, Enquirer Media, or whatever you call us, um, we, we still have the largest news gathering operation. And we can throw resources at things that our competitors can't. So that is encouraging. and, and uh, that's when we can do things really well. The other thing is because of all of the cutbacks, um, what you have in newsrooms today are probably the most competent journalists that ever existed because they're the cream of, of the crop. And they've had to get much more efficient. And I mean, I, I go back 40 years and the, the pace that a reporter would work at 40 years ago would be hilarious in a newsroom today because it's just today reporters are moving constantly. There's drawbacks to that. They, they get less time, we were talking beforehand, less time to think about improving their writing. And so you don't see the evolution of quality writing that you did in the past, but they're much more efficient in, in producing the content we need um, and, and unlike days of old where you would wait until you completed the story to publish, everything's in real time now. So they'll start publishing a story and as they get more people weighing in, they'll add to that. Well, meanwhile, they're working on other things. So I think we have very high quality journalists compensating for the drop in the staffing. I would guess, uh, same as in your newsrooms, we're going through a, uh, a process in our newsroom right now of uh, identifying our, our, our priorities for coverage based on what you and others uh, in our audience have told us you're interested in, either through surveys or uh, what you click on, which we obviously can see in our newsroom as well. And because our staff is smaller, uh, we're, we feel that it's important for us to identify those things that do resonate most with the audience. Um, and I don't want that to be confused with pandering. Uh, we're, not, we're not looking for clickbait. We're looking for the things that really matter to you in your lives. And so we'll focus on reporting those and let go of some of the things that, um, that may not be as interesting to the broad audience. Start with Michael, because it's right in your lap, Michael. The, the financial press has widely reported on the $1.4 billion takeover attempt by Alden Global Capital, a New York hedge fund, to acquire your parent company, Gannett. Alden, by the way, does not grant interviews or respond to questions from the press. Neither do I. No. Uh, <laughs> what is going on here, and what is at stake for Gannett's 100 newspapers, including the Enquirer and its related holdings? Oh, I've tried to tell the staff not to worry about things we can't control. Uh, well, you know, they, the, we'll, we'll learn a lot more in the next month. Um, clearly, Alden has, um, when they've taken over papers, have not always been kind to the to the staffs that exist. So uh, I think if you're gonna spend time thinking about it, you could work yourself up into a little anxiety over what could happen. But boy, Gannett's been around a long time, is, is a uh, national power player in the media world. So my hope would be things are status quo and, uh, and we weather the storm. But I, I have no inside info to share. <laughs> and I don't think I'm authorized to quote, speak for the company. But that, um, is, that is the biggest threat it right is, now to journalism. Yeah, for sure. Is the, the, there, there is money to be made by buying newspapers and, and taking all the assets out of them and leaving them broken. Uh, and it's dangerous for any um, newspaper that's owned by a publicly traded company. Um, what, 
what Digital First has managed to do is teach everybody, hey, there's a lot of money you can get out of that. And it's, uh, if you want to talk about the most serious threat to reporting right now, that's it. I'm, I'm fortunate. The company I work for, privately owned, we don't answer to stockholders, and the owners are committed to figuring a way through, but that's a rarity today. Every, every time the conversation is how do we make the most money versus how do we do quality journalism, it's always dangerous. Before we get to Alan, and this, this will land in your lap next, Alan, um, we're seeing this ongoing trend of ever larger conglomerates buying up uh, newspapers and other news entities, public and private. Today, five of America's largest media companies are owned by hedge funds or other large investors with several unrelated holdings including Gatehouse, owner of the Dispatch. What does this portend for the future of the Dispatch and similar Metro dailies? It's a good question. Um, I don't know that any of us can look into that crystal ball and, or the front office and tell you exactly what that means, but I can tell you that, um, uh, that much of what we're seeing in terms of newsroom uh, downsizing, um, the, the cuts that we've all faced, are cuts that started before the dispatch was sold. You knew that as well as anybody. Um, and and most, I would say most of what has happened uh, would have happened no matter who owned the paper. The, the financial situation is, is the same for everybody. Um, and I'm grateful that we've been given the opportunity in our newsroom to manage it um, in, in a way that, um, well, as, as Kirk Davis, the CEO of, of Gatehouse said to me when, uh, when I became editor, uh, I asked him, you know, what, what is your philosophy for our newsroom? And um, he paused and looked at me and he said, do the right thing. Do the right thing for your community. So that's, that's been the philosophy of, of Kirk Davis and Brad Harmon, our publisher, is, uh, to do the right thing for our community. And obviously we have financial parameters, but we're working hard toward that goal. Thank you. Maybe we'll start with Chris on this because you mentioned what's really at risk, and that is uh, the robust traditional First Amendment shoe leather uh, obligations of, uh, of our uh, newspapers and their related uh, operations. Can you give us a recent example or two of the uh, vital coverage provided by your, new, your news organizations that held those in power accountable, that resulted in needed reforms to benefit the community you serve that likely would not have occurred but for the presence of your newsrooms? And a subtext of that is whether you get many clicks on it or not, I don't know how many clicks you're getting on your ECOT coverage, but without the press covering ECOT, you know, that scandal would still be going on. I think. A lot of clicks. Um, so there was great interest in that story. Uh, maybe start with you, Chris. What what are you doing, and what's the, what's not going to occur if you if our newsrooms continue to shrink and shrink? You know, because of the the drop in resources, we we set out on a path about four years ago where where we were going to pick four or five things a year to do advocacy on and pour the resources into it. Whereas in the past, we might have been paying attention to a lot of things. We said, let's focus on making change. Uh, a former colleague and dear friend, Carl Turner's in the room, uh, used to work with me and, and we were having a conversation about this a few years ago and he said, look, we don't know how long we might be here, but while we're here, let's make it count. And one of the first projects that we we took on is that the Cuyahoga County justice system is completely broken. If you are poor, you go to jail for you know waiting trial you, uh, for long periods of time, you lose your job, you can lose your kids, um, and anybody with means goes in and out right away. And it was clear that, that the bail system needed to be reformed. Over the 20 plus years I'd been in Cleveland, there'd been multiple efforts to do that that the judges always stopped. So we decided, you know what? We're going to take that on and we're not going to stop. And so we, we started doing the research. We, we announced we were doing this. The judges immediately came out and said, yeah, we're not going to do that. And we said, okay, we'll start putting each one of you on our front of our site one a day with your lack of explanation for why you want to do this. The chief judge came in uh, like two days later, I think, said, okay, okay, we're going to do it. I'm getting people together. Um, and and we, we doubted it was in good faith, but we wanted to give them the benefit of the doubt. 
Um, it's been a couple of years. It's been a nonstop effort. The bail reform system is being reformed in Cuyahoga County. It's grown. I think you might see a, a consolidation of municipal courts and, and things are happening. All of this happened, by the way, uh, all of those steps in the beginning happened before the first story appeared in print. It was all a product of what we did online. And if we weren't there to drive that, that wouldn't happen. And if we weren't there every day asking where do we stand, where is it now, holding their feet to the fire, wouldn't happen. It's an investment of resources. It, it gets traffic, but I can tell you the Odell Beckham story today is getting way more <laughs> traffic. Alan, uh, one or two examples in, in less than two minutes. Um, all right, um, pharmacy benefit managers, um, uh, three words you probably never heard. <laughs> Three words you probably never heard before uh, a year ago when Marty Schladen, uh, one of the reporters in our newsroom, started wondering, um, what are these things and what, what do they do? And, um, and he and Daryl Rowland and Kathy Kandiski, um, Lucas Sullivan, they've, been, they've spent a good part of the past year revealing what they do and, and instead of saving money for uh, health care companies and insurance companies and all of us consumers, they're actually costing money. Uh, so that's one. Um, some of them are, are, are we, we always swing for the big ones uh, when we're having these conversations, but one that just came up this week, God love Randy Ledlow. He went and got his license uh, renewed and he came back to the office and he said, what the heck is this $1.50 lamination fee? <laughs> a great story on my license charge. And so he asks, what's, what's this about? And the state's like, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, guess we shouldn't be charging that to the tune of millions of dollars. Sadly though, the, the state's answer to that was to say, well, we're just gonna call it a different kind of fee and we're gonna double it. <laughs> Michael? Uh, in, in a big picture, uh, a couple years ago, we decided to uh, assign a report to cover the opioid crisis. And in 2017, we put out a section called Seven Days of Heroin. I, it precedes, I, I was not there at the time. Uh, Burl, our editor here, was not uh, there at the time, but um, won a Pulitzer Prize last year and uh, has made a significant impact in our community on awareness of the heroin epidemic. Uh, that's the big picture. Thanks. You're all uh, trying to leverage resources, and I'm almost at 12.55, so I'm, I'm supposed to announce that in five minutes uh, we're taking your questions, so please uh, think of questions to pose to these gentlemen, and the microphone is right back there in that end of the room. Uh, you're, you've all been for years trying to leverage resources, uh, trying to figure out what kind of partnerships uh, make sense. Uh, in the recent years, we've seen uh, news gathering organizations crop up that are uh, nonprofit and philanthropically supported, such as ProPublica, uh, the Texas Tribune, and here in Ohio, Eye on Ohio. Uh, what is your take on the viability of such nonprofits, their future, uh, and the larger issue of news operations supported by philanthropy? Alan, you want to start? I think they're filling a, an important role um, as our newsrooms shrink. Um, we have partnered, uh, actually this is something that has been going on for a decade or more in Ohio. Uh, all of us who have been competitors uh, and still are in some fronts um, really work very closely together in the Ohio News Organization and um, I, I see the, the nonprofits as part of that whole um, coalition, if you will. Uh, in fact, there is a, a coalition called Your Voice Ohio, which is more than 50 news organizations in Ohio that get together regularly to talk about um, and then report on issues that are important to all of our communities. So far, as a, as a coalition, we've tackled the heroin opioid epidemic, um, the economy in Ohio, and the whole coalition got started um, in the run up to the presidential election uh, because we felt that there was too much um, rhetoric and not enough discussion about the actual issues and so we started putting issues in front of candidates and and making them respond to those as and it it carries a lot more weight when it's 50 news organizations as opposed to individual news organizations 
Chris, the future of partnerships and philanthropy? Uh, look, I think the, the nonprofits uh, do a great job. They don't have the sizable platforms. And so what we bring to that is we can spread the word uh, of what they're reporting in a way they can't. And we're grateful to have anybody out there that's helping to do public service work. So the more of that, the better. Michael. You know, we, we actually have some in our community that are started by former employees of our company um, and how they feel about us depends on whether we can partner with them. But I, th I think we're all more open to partnerships, working together, working with others than we've ever been uh, because we're not, we're not all in this, you know, uh, we're not all gonna survive on our own. So we, we wanna work with each other. Thank you, last question for me before we get to our audience. Maybe we'll start with you, Michael, and go that way. Uh, according to many, many surveys f over many years, including most recently Pew Research, Americans overwhelmingly think the news media is one-sided. When asked if the media deal fairly with all sides or tend to favor one side, 74% of Americans say the media is one-sided. What, what are your news organizations doing to build trust among news consumers to distinguish your news operations as a trusted, high-quality op op option in the news marketplace? Yeah, that was a, that was a topic a month or two ago at the uh, Ohio News Media Association conference here. Uh, I, I, look, that, the perception of media bias goes back decades and decades and decades, right? You're a Republican media outlet, you're a Democratic. So I, I don't think that's new. I think the lack of trust um, that starts at the top and comes down has, has affected us all. But uh, what can we do? We can be uh, the best journalists we can possibly be. We can be accurate, we can be fair and balanced, we can take great pains to make sure that all the great tenets of journalism are upheld in every story. And as long as we do that and we can all look ourselves in the mirror, uh, that's the best I think we can, we can do. Chris? Yeah, we, we know we're successful when we go into the comments and you have one on top of the other, one saying you're a shill for the Democrats and the next one saying you're a shill for the Republicans. It's like, okay, score, we've, we've offended everybody. Um, that, that's existed from the beginning. I think we all seek to include as many voices as possible. I think we all welcome and invite uh, guest columns um, and, and, you know, the true measure of what people think of us is how often they come back. And as we said at the beginning, none of us have ever had bigger audiences than we have now. Alan, to just preface, you've polishing this one off. When I was editor, the paper was always being accused of being a Republican rag. Now it's always being accused of being a Democratic <laughs> rag. So uh, it's Alan. How, how do you find a balance? Um, well, it, it's all in the eye of the beholder, right? And we get, we get it, the criticism from both sides as well. Um, but to check ourselves, we do several things. One, um, I write a column every week where I try to explain how we do what we do and why we do it uh, and invite people to respond and comment on that. And then, believe me, they do. Um, we also established a reader advisory board. Um, uh, the first, we've done this three, three we're in our third year. Um, uh, I put a solicitation in my column for people who wanted to volunteer. Um, we got more than 300 applications the first year. Uh, it's been that way ever since, and for 30 slots. Uh, we meet once a month, and um, they, they appreciate what we do, and, uh, but they don't necessarily always agree, and they don't hold back. Um, so it's, that has been um, a, a very refreshing, uh, engaging conversation about how we can, and we genuinely want to know, uh, from them and from all of you and anybody in the community. How can we do better at what we do? Uh, what what can we do uh, that we're not doing that, that would serve you better? Uh, so you. we're open to that. As you know, it is CMC's tradition to take audience questions. Please state your name and ask your question. Please avoid editorial comments. And remember, questions must end with a question mark. Let's get started. First question, please. Hi there, I'm Andrea Applegate with Applegate Talent Strategies. I'm gonna violate it. First of all, I like a piece of paper. I like something to have and to hold. Um, my question, and I'm not sure how to frame this, but um, I'm responding to the extraordinary reporting of the Columbus Dispatch. I think that daily newspapers are very important in holding um, politicians, government agencies, businesses, community leaders, holding them 
them accountable. When you're talking about um, the, the providing the value and the, the business um, opportunity, is it, it, what is the value? Is it, um, is it something different or is it merely, not merely, but a civic responsibility? You, that we should all support our daily newspapers because it's the right thing to do for our community? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a softball across the middle of the plate. You better hit it out of the park. Yeah, this is, that, that's a great question. I mean, I mean clearly, uh, I feel this, this, may, this is one moment where I'll say I'm biased. Uh, I feel it's, it's all of our responsibilities to be educated voters and citizens, and it's hard to do that if you're not reading news from a newsroom like mine. And I, I purposely didn't say paper because, again, it doesn't matter to me whether you read it on your phone or, or on paper, because what we, what we produce every day is the kind of information, the, the local news, uh, in addition to all the stories that we provide from wire service, the local news you can't get anywhere else. Chris, I, I, I don't, I don't feel comfortable saying it's a civic responsibility to to pay us. I mean, we're in business. We we are selling a product, and and we like to think that what we do is a public service. But really, the onus is on us to provide people with something they're willing to pay for, either through advertising or directly for content. Uh, I don't think we've found that quite yet, but I think we're getting closer to it. But, but you should get something that you pay for, and we need to provide that. And, Password, and, and I think in a, in a world of return on investment focus, I think that uh, our industry has to message a little better about what we provide. Uh, if we're posting 50 to 60 pieces of content per day, uh, that's like 12 to 1,500 pieces of content a month. There's a value to that. And when I, when I say that to friends who subscribe or don't subscribe, they're shocked by that volume. But we're constantly updating our sites and we're constantly pushing out content. And there's a, there's a value to that. It's not, we're not putting up three stories a day that we're asking you to pay for. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, my name is John McKnight with Lucky Dog T-shirts. And before my question, I want to point out, I'm here with my father today, who's a 41-year retired veteran from the Associated Press. Um, so, yeah. So, I'm not a reporter, but I've, maybe I've got it in my blood. I don't know. Um, I like the paper. Um, you know, I grew up with my dad being a reporter. I delivered the Citizen Journal when I was a kid, and I like holding the physical paper, just like the last person said. My brother-in-law the other day was telling me that I'm a complete dinosaur. He gets annoyed when they put the free newspaper on his front porch because he says he has to go out there and pick it up to recycle it, and he didn't ask for it. Um, so. I guess my question is, is there an advantage to the physical newspaper? I mean, I'm going to cling to it. I, I like it. Um, but am I a dinosaur? I mean, is there really no reason for it? Should I, you know? We have four more questioners in the next 11 minutes, so quickly hit this. Look, the beauty of the newspaper is it's a curated list of, of content that somebody has decided this is the news of the day. Um, there are a lot of people today that don't want somebody doing that for them. And the problem with the newspaper is it's dated. Nobody in Cleveland waited for the plain dealer today to get excited about Odell Beckham Jr. Everybody was ingesting that last night. And so the curation is the value, but it's stale by the time you get it. Any postscript on that before we move on? I, I just think we've all realized there's, a, there's many, many different ways to reach readers, whether it's print, whether it's online, whether it's social media. Uh, and and uh, so I wouldn't say that about any of our audience. Next question, please. Yes, sir. Hi, my name's Trip Lazarus, and when I tell people today, ask people today, ask me where I was going and CMC, what's it about, the state of the news, and then it's like, oh, oh, <laughs> that's heavy, uh, because the state of the news, and maybe it's not the state of the news, it's the state of people reading the news, it's the state of of how news is being provided on the extremes and people are getting just the news they want a lot of times, or a lot of people are. So I'm just, you know, 
I'm kind of interested in your thoughts about that state of the news, uh, the three of you, um, that it's, it's, is it the enemy of the people? Um, it, you know, or how, how can we encourage all of us to be, you know, more general in what we take in, I guess? I have to say, um, one of the most sobering things I've heard as a newsman in, um, in the recent times is in 2016 when I believe it was Merriam-Webster's dictionary de declared the, the word of the year post-truth, as in the time after which people cared about the truth. Um, clearly that's not applicable to everybody or you wouldn't be here today. Um, but it is a sad commentary that some people just really don't, they, they don't care about the truth. Um, and it's part of our responsibility, I believe, to, um, to show that there is value to the truth. And, um, yeah, and, and I think the, the problem with that is, is, is that we're not, we're categorizing, categorizing, putting everything in the category of news um, and we're, we're not all in the same category. I mean, there are elements of the news that, that are horrible, but Alan's pointed out a couple of times here that what we try to do in our regional news operations is be responsible and careful and, and, and accurate. Um, so, so I think there's a difference in what we do than what, what you might get on Fox News or some of the others. Um, and I, you know, I really don't want to be co-branded with them because that's not who we are. It, it even goes beyond that. Be, um, there was a caller who um, called into our newsroom in January complaining about something that we said about a story. And when I kind of drilled down on where that, that comment was that they were upset about, it was a Facebook post from, from somebody in the community. And I think, un unfortunately, um, the country is starting to think of media as all of it together, and that's a problem for us because we're trying to separate ourselves with factual, well-reported journalism, and people think a Facebook post is media, and that's a challenge. Next question. Hi, my name is Bruce Garfield, and I'm the executive director of the Columbus Music Commission. With the constant deluge of contentious news emanating out of Washington, D.C., do you find your readership is starting to suffer atrophy from this type of reporting? Again, 4.2 4 million unique visitors in January, so no. Yeah, right, not seeing that at all. I don't think there's ever been more interest, well, modern times in, in news and discussion. We're, this has been a good time to be in the news business. Andy, how many, time, how many more questions do we have time for? Okay. Yes. Hi, I'm Jamie O'Leary. I'm with the Crane Center for Early Childhood at OSU, and I recently stumbled onto a dinner time game that I play with my kids, who are three and five, about whether something's a fact or an opinion. And it's been very illuminating for me, and my five-year-old's actually gotten really good at sort of arguing why something is a fact or an opinion. And I share that um, as it relates to my question, which is, what can parents and teachers and sort of the community do um, in this post-truth world in terms of sort of teaching them skills to read critically, think critically, um, and just as that relates to the larger civic responsibility um, in reading the news? So if, if you have thoughts on that. Can I you. jump in and answer that first? Check out the News Literacy Alliance, newsliteracyalliance.org or com. It is a uh, national network of legacy news providers, your major networks, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, all the big people, as well as all your metro, a lot of your metro people are in this. The News Media Alliance is, has put out curriculum for teachers and families from K through college, news literacy curriculum, uh, acknowledging that we have to teach news literacy just like we've always taught basic literacy and numeracy to help uh, students, youngsters at the youngest ages, understand how to separate the real stuff from the bad stuff. Uh, I have three teenagers. <clears throat> they have some opinions. Uh, and, I, and I teach at the University of Cincinnati. And what I, what I try to differentiate for them is an opinion that's based on facts. So it's not just an emotional, blah, I heard this from so-and-so at school, or I heard this from a friend. But what what are the facts behind it, and then what do you think? And uh, I, you know, 
I don't know if that works or not. <laughs> Jury's out. I think the most important thing you can teach is for people to, to consider the source of the information. When people are looking on social media, they see a headline, they don't think about where it's coming from, and I think that people need to rely on trusted sources. I think your lesson is a fabulous one, not just for children, but for people of all ages. Uh, <laughs> really. <laughs> well, one last question. You have... Hi, my name is Lucia Walensis. I'm from Ion, Ohio, uh, the Ohio Center for Nonprofit Journalism, uh, which is, uh, as he mentioned before, a very tiny news nonprofit. Uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on fake news. And obviously, it's a huge problem. And, and how do you deal with that, people who are out there kind of purposely spreading misinformation? And you're talking about the president, of course. <laughs> Go ahead, take it. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, again, I, uh, the definition of what fake news was supposed to be is not what it's turned into. What it's turned into is, I don't like the story, I don't agree with the story, it's fake. And again, in our world of educating our audience, that, that's the challenge because a, a fake news story planted by another country to upset the apple cart that was what the, the term was intended for. It wasn't intended for, I don't, I don't like the story, therefore it's fake news. And that's what it's turned into, unfortunately. And that's our, I think that's our challenge. Last word, either Alan or Chris. We don't do fake news. <laughs> last word. Carol Looper. I hope you found today's forum interesting. I think it was very important. Uh, we are 54 year subscribers to the Daily Columbus Dispatch, and I just paid my bill. <laughs> Let's thank the Carol A. McGuire Legacy Fund celebrating arts and culture. <clears throat> and our sponsors, the Columbus Foundation and Dispatch Media Group, and our speakers, Michael Perry, Alan Miller, Chris Quinn and Mike Curtin. And thank you all so much for being here. A lot to think about. Hope to see you next week.